So today, I want to spend a little bit of time, as I said, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, but before we get there, um, just you know, recognizing it's a new year, and uh, there's lots of new things, and uh, for some of you at Christmas, you got some new things. Uh, maybe you got a new toothbrush. Anybody, was anybody hoping for that this Christmas? Or maybe some new socks. Anybody? So- yeah? Um, when I was a kid, I'll just get this off my chest. It might be a therapeutic moment. I was always upset because on Christmas morning, my stocking was full of socks. (laughs) Anybody else have that problem? Am I the only one? Um, I figured there should be other fun things in my stocking, but socks was one of them. Anyway, um, but uh, we, we've kind of got into this new year now, and uh, with all the newness and all the hopes and anticipations and dreams and joys and everything else, we're a week in, and uh, if you have already set some goals and decided, I think, was it this past Friday that's known as Quitters Friday? Um, <clears throat> that uh, It's usually that first Friday in January. is like, if you haven't started started on any of your New Year's resolutions yet is usually when you give up. Uh, And so... (laughs) That's why they call it Quitters Friday uh, in January. Um, there is hope. Don't give up. Uh, keep, keep moving forward. There's still time. So I'll just encourage you with that. But as we've been thinking about the new year, especially this year, I've become a little bit more nostalgic or maybe sentimental myself uh, than normal. And uh, the reason is because I've been thinking a lot about this past decade. Um, a lot can happen in a decade, can't it? Uh, as I've been thinking about that, and last Sunday I shared a little bit uh, over the last 10 years, you know, it was 10 years ago that we started here in Argyle, and in fact, it was uh, January the 6th, so today's the 7th, January 6th was a Monday in 2014, um, that was my first day here, and uh, every once in a while, the memories of Facebook show up of me standing in the cabin with my, um, with my jacket on and my backpack and a dress shirt <laughs> to come into a Monday morning work. Um, I was the only one here that day. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then I, I rolled in and into uh, the office back there, and we hadn't quite got the desk situation figured out because we had this massive desk from Zion Baptist Church, uh, solid maple, um, three drawers on both sides. I mean, the top of it is an inch and a half, two inches thick, one piece. Um, and so uh, we had to, when we got that from Zion Baptist Church, we had to bring it down from the, like the second level of the church down those winding steps, if you recall, and out the front door and onto a truck and out here. And anyway, it took a little bit, and uh, we, we, and we were kind of getting that fixed up too, and we had, somebody had offered to, to make sure that it would be kind of cleaned up and refinished and a few things done to it. And so, um, so I rolled in with one of those like three by three tables that you can hook together, you know, those little plywood ones. I think we still got some of them in the basement and sitting at my desk in my new office that Mike and Jen had freshly painted. And I can recall uh, walking in and uh, they had painted the bottom all white. Uh, and then the top was this lovely color of green that Carolyn picked out. And she thought, this is, this is, you should, you should have this nice green. It'll freshen up the space. It'll look nice. And the story goes, <laughs> the story, the story goes that Mike and Jen came in the office and he opened the can and he looked at it and he looked at Jen and back to the can and back to the Jen and said, are you sure this is the right color? <laughs> Um, that, is that how that went? Is that about accurate? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, I recall that day. Um, now, last week, uh, and I've mentioned we've been here 10 years, and maybe that's why I'm a little bit nostalgic over these, uh, these days uh, into the new year more than normal. Last week, I mentioned something about being here 10 years and um, the fact that uh, I think I preached over 1,000 sermons, um, and that that's, was to help us kind of talk about being rooted in the Word. And, but as I said some of that, I saw a look of concern on some of your faces. And over this past week, I was having a conversation with a couple of people who said, when you said you'd been here 10 years, I thought, oh great, here we go. So just set your minds at ease. I'm not announcing my resignation <laughs> today. I wasn't last week. Okay, no. Again, that's not the point, but I just, I don't want you to think, oh great, here's the sermon that is, that's where it's coming. So that's not where we're going today, okay? So just, just, to, just to set your minds at ease. So there's no plans to do so. There's, there's none of that happening. Okay, so what I want to do today um, 
as I've been reflecting on that, is to kind of camp out on uh, this one verse that's been on my mind actually for the past couple of months. And so I guess at the risk of a bit of self-indulgence, I want to just kind of offer a little bit of reflection. And as we start in the new year, a little bit of gratitude at the same time. Can we do that? Would that be okay? Um, A little bit different than kind of our normal, um, you know, how I would preach or what we get. We'll get into that next week. We're starting a brand new series in John chapter 3, and there's some thick stuff there, and we're really looking forward to diving in. But today is just a little lighter on the side of kind of exegesis, a little more on the heart, and, and so we're going we're gonna to kind of go there. I'll try to keep it together as I do so. Um, I want to camp out on that verse uh, with some reflection and gratitude. The book of Thessalonians, the letter to the church in Thessalonica, uh, comes on the heels of an event that happened in the city of Thessalonica. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 17 in the first 10 verses there. What's happened is the Apostle Paul uh, has moved from across the from Asia Minor over to what is now modern day Greece. He's landed in Philippi where he preaches the gospel and the first convert there was Lydia down by the water. If you recall that story, she was someone who dyed purple cloth and, and as he preaches down there, he, they went down supposing to find um, a kind of a place of worship for pagan religions and they come across these women and they start sharing with them about Jesus and so a church get, gets planted in Philippi and after remaining there for some time, and Paul actually has great affection for the church in Philippi. When you read the letter of the Philippians, it's Paul's most joyful letter, his most, you know, kind of overflowing with gratitude and love and positivity. There's like a lot of great things about the letter to Philippi. But then when they leave Philippi, so Paul's not on his own. He's, he's got, um, at this point, Luke with him, who's his traveling companion, who's kind of documenting and recording and cr- um, chronicling uh, where, they're, where they've headed and where they're going and what happened happened there. And so that's why we have the book of Acts that explains all of that. And what we're in now is Paul's second missionary journey. And he has kind of three major missionary journeys. So this is the second one. When they leave Philippi, they get down to Thessalonica. And this is about 49 to 51 AD. So the church as a whole kind of post-resurrection um, is about 15, you know, 18 years old since Christ has been raised from the dead. Paul travels into Thessalonica with Silas and Timothy and perhaps a few others. And when he gets into Thessalonica, he does what is his custom. He goes down to the synagogue and he starts to reason there with some of the Jews about how Jesus is the Christ, how Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that um, they've been anticipating and longing for and looking for. And and he demonstrates from the scriptures how that is the case. Uh, And then from the Jews, he goes to the Greeks or to the Gentiles, to those who are uh, are not Jewish. And as he does so, he begins to preach and to speak and, and, and throughout the course of all of this in Thessalonica is the time that he's there. There are many, it says, Jews and Greeks and notably women of influence or status within society who come to faith in Jesus. And so it's not just Jews. It's not just Greeks. It's not just men. It's, it's a whole bunch of different types and kinds of people. Jews, Greeks, men, women, people of influence, people not of influence, um, people of wealth and status, people not of wealth and status. There are many who come to faith in Jesus in Thessalonica who respond to the gospel, who believe it, and who give their lives to trusting and following Jesus. But in the process of this happening and a church being established, there are some Jews who become quite jealous of what's happened. Quite particularly, I think, or most pointedly, some of those Jews within their own synagogue who had now come to faith in Jesus, and and they hadn't, and that created some tension there. And so some of these Jews became very jealous, and in the process formed a mob. And so this was no kind of small thing. This becomes, the escalation of this uh, grows quite quickly. And they form a mob, and then in the process, they start to make the issue not an issue of theology and of faith and of practice, but they make the issue an issue of politics. And so they head into uh, the town center and they talk to some of the leaders there and they say, there's something happening in our town you need to be aware of. There's a group of people here who are preaching a message. And because they're jealous about these uh, people who have come to faith in Jesus and this church being established and perhaps even some being pulled away, um, because of that, they leverage that moment to point to, I think, a different issue in order to 
kind of stir up trouble. And the thing that they raise to the city council, as it were, is that these people proclaim a message that someone other than Caesar is Lord. So they turn it political quite quickly. And, and that didn't sit well with the city council and the city leaders because to say anyone but Caesar is Lord puts you in trouble with Caesar. And Caesar is the most powerful person in the world. And if you're in trouble with Caesar, then you're going to be in trouble. And bad things happen when Caesar gets upset. And so, so what happens is the city council takes this quite seriously and, and they go to investigate and they try to find Paul and Silas and, and Timothy. And as they do so, they can't find them, but they do discover somebody who has come to faith. His name is Jason. And they, they come to Jason's house, and they actually overrun Jason's house looking for Paul and Silas and Timothy. But when they can't find those three, they decide to take Jason. And they pull Jason and some of his companions, others who have come to faith as a result of preaching the gospel, and Jason and the rest get drugged into kind of the, the center of the city, and it becomes a costly ordeal for them. Because it's not until Jason and company pay a significant amount of money um, in order to satisfy the kind of chief leaders of the city that they are free to go. And so costly in the sense of very costly financially for them. But through the night, then Paul and company um, are led to escape through um, a window in the city wall and they disappear into the night for their own protection, for their own safety, and some commentators even say for the protection and safety of the church as well. Because if Paul and company are still there, it could create even more issues. And so Paul and company leave, and they head 75 kilometers away to a place called Berea, which uh, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you might, you might understand that and know that and the story of what happens there. But because Paul and company left in such a hurry, it kind of broke Paul's heart that he wasn't able to hang around longer. He was a bit upset that he wasn't there to kind of help nurture and disciple uh, in the way that he wanted to be able to do for the church. But he had to leave, and so he escaped through the night, and so eventually he decides, look, we'll send Timothy back to do some of that work that we weren't able to finish. And so they send Timothy back, um, because he wants them to know that not only have we not abandoned you, by the way, because we had to leave and we had to do so quickly and in the middle of the night and we didn't get to say goodbye to anyone. Because of that, we wanted to let you know that we didn't simply abandon you, but there's certain things we want to make sure that you are well-rooted and established in. So he sends Timothy back. Timothy uh, does the work there. He comes back to Paul. He reports to Paul all that's happened and some of the questions that the Thessalonians have, and that's what prompts Paul to write his letter that we call 1 Thessalonians, and he sends that letter back to the church to answer some of their questions. But when you read 1 Thessalonians, a good chunk of the letter, even the first half of it, is really about recounting that history and Paul's passion for the people and the work and the mission and the church and, and, and what they had experienced while they were there. And so the first chapter of Thessalonians really speaks to the very, in many ways, dramatic conversion of the people in Thessalonians. And not only their dramatic conversion of their repenting from sin and renouncing certain things and certain activities and behavior and then turning from those things into toward God and the change of life that came as a result, not only that, but, but the fact that they had an effective witness now in their city, so much so that their witness in their city gained a reputation among the other churches in the region eventually. Which is quite fascinating because the other people say, oh, the church in Thessalonica, that, th there's something going on there. The people that are passionate for the Lord, they love Jesus. They, their lives have been turned around and things are happening. And, and man, it is, is amazing. And so they've gained a reputation for their faith in Christ. And then in chapter two, Paul reminds them, he says, look, I just, I, you know, this probably should go without saying, but I want to remind you of our personal integrity among you and how we didn't come to you greedy. We didn't come to you looking, you know, for uh, great compensation because of our work, which traveling philosophy of the day, that's what they did, and sometimes in underhanded ways, they would kind of, you know, charge for their, their um, you know, they'd roll into a city, and they'd 
talk philosophy for a while and people would pay them to do so and then they'd leave. And so that was a common thing in that day, especially in Greek culture. And, and Paul says, look, we're, we're not like that. We walked with integrity among you. We weren't greedy. We didn't kind of water down the message at all. We didn't kind of change things just to satisfy uh, certain people. That's, that's not what we were about. And we had integrity among you. And just like uh, a mother, a nursing mother cares for her infant child and just like a father cares for their own child, that's how we treated you. And that's what we wanted to accomplish among you. And then he says this in chapter 2, verse 8. He says, and so, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you. Now, there's more to it. I'm going to break it up into just a few quick things here. He says, we were ready to share with you. That is, we were resolved. We'd made up our minds to share with you. And, and the way that it's written has the sense in it in terms of the grammar is not only had we made up our mind and we'd resolved and we'd decided something, but it was a decision based out of gladness. We were happy to do this. We were eagerly ready. We were like bursting at the seams. Like this is going to be great. It's going to be exciting. We're all in. We're just, we're so ready to share with you two things. The first, he says, is this. We are eager to share with you not only the gospel of God. Not only the gospel of God. The gospel of God, yes, is primary in its importance. In fact, that's what has compelled us, Christ's love has compelled us to bring the good news to you. Christ's love has compelled us to leave the east side of the Mediterranean, travel all the way through Asia Minor and back, and then on the second missionary journey, all the way through back through some of those churches, and now across to Philippi, and now down to Thessalonica. And we've traveled all that distance to tell you the good news about Jesus. That's right. Paul would say, Christ has commanded or commissioned me to do, to bring the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. And so we've come to tell you the good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That in him there's, there's forgiveness of sins, that we can be reconciled to God, that we can be saved from our sins and from its consequence, that we can enjoy life forever with God in heaven and not separated and cut off from him forever. We can enjoy the presence of God in this life now, that, that, that eternal life that Jesus spoke about begins in the here and now and carries on into what is to come. And so it's, eternal life is knowing God. And so we've come to, to bring to you this message of good news and of reconciliation reconciliation and through faith and repentance, repentance from sin and faith in Jesus and what he has done and his life of obedience to God, his perfect life of obedience and his death uh, substitutionary for our sins and his being raised to life that we too would not, ha death wouldn't have the last word over our lives. Like through faith in him, we also have uh, access to that life that that is the good news of God. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has saved us from our sins, has transformed who we are, and we live with greater purpose. We live with the hope of heaven, and we've come to bring that message to you. And we've arrived with that message, and we arrived with that mission, and, and it has transformed your lives. That good news, we've seen the evidence of it. We've seen the dramatic conversion that's taken place in your life of people who did not know God and who now know God through Jesus. And so not only were we being affectionately, being affectionately desirous of you, ready to share with you the gospel of God, but, he says, also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. That is, our own lives. For Paul and Silas and Timothy, it wasn't just a mission trip that they were on. This was something very personal. And in fact, what we don't get in the English is that he says about the Thessalonians that they are beloved. You have become very dear to us is beloved by us, to be loved. You are loved by us, he says. And so, affectionately desirous of you. That's what we were. We were ready 
eager, excited, anticipated to share with you not only the gospel of God about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and the forgiveness and reconciliation that comes through repentance and faith in him, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us. As I've been thinking over that verse for the last couple months, it's kind of run through my mind and circle back and around again. Um, this is the nostalgia piece. I, you know, when we, when we left camp, because we got married uh, in 2012, um, uh, kind of in August 2013 was our last summer at Camp Pinal, Carol and I. Um, I always thought after 14 summers at Camp Penile, whenever I left, whenever that day came, whenever that moment was, I would be moving away somewhere <laughs> um, out of the South Shore. That was always, that was all, there, was, there wasn't anything in my mind that I thought, well, we'll we're going to be somewhere near, we'll probably past it, maybe even back to the homeland, New Brunswick, right? Uh, Maybe that's where we go. I, I had no idea, but I always anticipated that that would be the case. And I remember um, we felt that our time at camp was done. And, and uh, when we left camp, um, we ended up uh, for about a month thinking, okay, what are we going to do? Um, Carolyn's still teaching. I was going to wrap up end of the year. Um, we were just kind of pray and wait on and see what was going to happen. And, and then somebody mentioned that... Um, APBC was looking for someone to fill a pulpit and, and to pastor here. And um, we just, through the course of that whole process, felt that it seemed easy, almost too easy of a fit and a transition and all the rest. But as we, as we thought about it, it was like easy doesn't necessarily mean wrong. And the timing of it all seemed to be right. It seemed to be an opportunity where I could use my gifts the way that God had wired me and felt like a good fit here with, uh, with the church, but primarily because we knew some of the people here already through camp connections and, and whatever else. But it's because of some of the people primarily that, that we felt that this is where we needed to land. And so we were ready. When we started, we were, we were eager, we were, we were excited. This was, this was a great thing. And we were eager at the same time for a couple of things. One, to share with you the gospel of God. Um, I was asked, I don't know, a while ago now, somebody said to me, you know, when you think about, uh, it's been like over a year ago, I don't remember why I remember this conversation, but the, the, the question that was asked to me was, um, when you think about your preaching, what, do you think there's any particular emphasis in your preaching? I said, yeah, I think there's three. One is Levitical holiness codes. Two is uh, eschatology and apocalyptic literature. And the third is uh, politics. Those are my three things that I tend to focus on continually. Uh, I said, no, that's, that's not the case. <laughs> Those are not the things. The things that I tend to focus on, as much as I can tell, is about what it means to trust and follow Jesus. Like if there's a thread that I would identify through all of it, that's what it is. Like it's the good news of God and how does that affect my life? It's the good news of the gospel and what does that mean for me? It's the good news of what God has done to seek and to save me who was lost, to reconcile me to him. And now as that has happened and I've come to trust him by faith, how do I then live? What does that require and demand of me as I trust and follow Jesus? And, and so that's been what I've, try to these whole times to, to kind of encourage and invite us into is what does it look like and mean to trust and follow Jesus. And for some of us, as I've said repeatedly, our first step is coming to faith in Christ. But there are many steps after that as we continue to pursue him. And so week in and week out, it's how do we trust and follow Jesus? And look, there's things I'm still trying to figure out in that on my own right, in my life, and what does that look like, and what does it mean? Is that, is that okay to say that out loud? Like, is that too vulnerable for some? I know I'm supposed to have all the things together, right, because I'm the professional. Is that, the, no. So, so this is the thing, and, and so, so we work at that, and, and, but, but my hope and my goal in sharing the gospel of God is that's where we start, and the gospel's not something we move on from once we understand it. No, it's something we grow deeper into all the more that we understand it. And so eager to share with you the gospel of God and to preach in season and out of season. 
when it seems like um, there are some great things happening and there's some response to the message and that people are encouraged and helped. And then on the days where I walk up the hill and beat myself up and go, well, I blew that. I might as well quit tomorrow. Um, <laughs> you know, from all the in seasons and out of seasons, just that continual pushing week in and week out to trust and follow Jesus, but not only in sharing the gospel of God, but our own selves as well. And so 10 years ago, again, that first Sunday um, in January in 2014, when we were here, it was our first Sunday. Um, at the end of the service, Carol and I made an announcement um, that she was pregnant with Emma. I don't know if you recall that. I think my words were, we're doing our part to grow the church. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, but as I think of sharing our own selves these past now 10 years, um, this is the only home Ryan and Emma have ever known. Which is strange to think of for me because, you know, I grew up in New Brunswick, went to school, went to another school, worked at camp all those years. Like, there's been a little bit of movement for me to different places. Carolyn was out west for a while. Like, there's a lot of that in our story, but this is my kids' home. This is what they know. This is where they're growing up. This is um, where they live. It's our home as much as it is your home, we feel. It's where we live, it's where we work, it's where we play, it's where school happens, it's where we get our groceries, all the pieces of life that are part of that, that's, that's, this is it. This is the space, this is the place. And we have laughed at a lot of things. We have experienced sorrow through these last 10 years. Uh, many of us have been through very difficult and hard things. Some of us have lost loved ones, friends, but through it all, we, I think we could say we have continued to trust God in the midst of it. And I know that you often, um, I don't know what's wrong, <laughs> sorry. Pull it together. Um, I know you often call me Pastor Mitchell. Remember that first moment um, that Sunday, Cody? <laughs> Can I tell that story? <laughs> I walked in and um, Cody was standing in the hallway. I came in on a Sunday morning and he looks at me and goes, Pastor Mitchell? And I looked at him and I said, Cody. How, like this is like first couple of weeks and said, Cody, how long have you known me at camp? Right, and you call me Moose of all things. Like, <laughs> come on, like the pastor bit's not necessary, okay? So I, I wasn't used to that because I didn't, like that wasn't a thing for me. And so, um, so it was kind of interesting. And then the first seniors lunch we had, um, Florence, God bless her soul, came up to me as we were cleaning up and she looks at me and she says, Pasta, you and I is gonna have conflict. <laughs> I said, Florence, what? She says, you told Cody not to call you Pasta. <laughs> she says, I told him, I'm trying to teach him respect, she said. I said, well, Florence, it's all right then, so. Um, <laughs> so it's taking a little get used to. Um, and you call me Pastor Mitchell quite often, uh, even good friends. Um, but I think most of you know me as Mitchell as well, <laughs> as if there's distinction. You get what I'm saying. In all of that, there's so much I can say. Um, and again, the risk of being self-indulgent, that's not what I want to do this morning. That's not the point. The point of all of this, and thinking about this verse in the past decade, um, I just want to say thank you. for lots of things, but primarily um, the many ways that you have been gracious to you and encouraged me. And I know it's a risk to invite a 33-year-old to be the pastor of the church. <laughs> There's a lot to that. Um, 
the thank you for that. And thank you for, if I can say, uh, not putting extra pressure on my wife and kids um, as well. Thank you for inviting us to be a part of your lives and what God is doing here. In the hard times when we've sat in hospital rooms together, um, the hallways of funeral homes, through COVID, <laughs> let's just move on from there. Um, <laughs> three years of 10, um, in the private struggles that you've faced, that we've talked through on various levels, through some of the relational turbulence you've encountered and issues that you've had that we've talked through. So through the hard things, those are part of it. Through the high points of weddings, um, those celebrations, baptisms, no golf claps, um, through those come to Jesus moments that have happened for some, for the times of growth that you've experienced and been a part of, for the favor of God that we've seen on our lives. A lot could happen in 10 years, and thank you for being a part of what God is doing here. And I want to say thank you, as Paul says to the, Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians, a couple of things as well that he says that I would echo, that I believe to be true, for your work of faith that is evidenced by the fruit shown in your lives because of the genuine effort you put into giving of your time, of your talent, of your treasure, through the many, many hours of prayer that you have prayed, through the many ways that you have actively sought to express your faith in God through your everyday actions and lives. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for your labor of love that is not motivated simply by duty or compulsion, but out of a genuine love for Jesus and for others as well. And for your steadfastness of hope, of sticking with it, of your faith when it's hard, trusting God in the middle of those difficult things, for the encouragement that you've brought to one another, both within this church and for those outside. And I think I can honestly say that for Carol and I, our affection for you has grown because you have become very dear to us. And so the next decade, I, I don't know what's gonna happen in 10 years. <laughs> um, it's probably best none of us do. Um, but my hope is that we would be ready. We would be resolved with gladness happy to, to do something significant, to be full of joy and wonder about the move of God in our lives and in this area, to be resolved to be a part of it, that we would be ready with whatever it is God is calling us to step into, that, that we would be ready to share not only the gospel of God, the good news about Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, the, the hope that we have in him, that we would not only be eager to share the gospel of our lives as well, letting people know that they matter to you and to God. And so whether that's inviting someone for the first time, inviting someone back who's maybe been away for some time, not only to a service, although that might be part of it, but to a life of faith, to a life of hope in Jesus, to a life of, of mystery and joy and excitement in what God is doing to transform the world. Because Jesus did tell us that we are salt and light. And we don't want the salt to lose its saltiness or the light to be covered up under a bowl. But we want to just continue to encourage and push us and remind us to continue to, trusting, to trust in and follow Jesus together because that's what he's called us to. 
And so, just as we start the new year again, the, you know, this is like I get one of these probably every 10 years maybe, okay? So, um, so that's, that's what it is. But, but again, I just I want to say thank you. Thank you for, for you, for the people that we are. We do dearly love you. And, and we do pray that God continues to use us, um, not only as we grow in our own lives um, of faith, but as we continue to trust and follow him and lead others to do the same.